calling to order the special meeting of the Bloomfield Hills Schools Board of Education. It is April 17th, 2024. We are starting later than um, scheduled today. We were supposed to start at 6 p.m. We had some issues from the storms with uh, electricity and HVAC, and I wanna give a special shout out to Matt Lowe, our amazing um, HVAC engineer within the district, because this is two nights in a row that he's come back after hours to save us um, so we can proceed with our meeting tonight. And we have electricity, so that's great. Um, all right, um, Trustee Noble, can you please take attendance? Everyone is present and accounted for. Thank you, let's please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, moving on to Section 2A, um, the community uh, viewing and feedback opportunity. Um, all of these meetings are open to the public and being live streamed cable casts and are re recorded for later viewing. Recordings and information on the superintendent search is available on the board's education webpage. All right, um, moving on to, might be missing a page here. But the rest, the item on the agenda? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right. I guess we're interviewing Billy. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, moving on to the next section, we will begin with our uh, first round interview of Mr. Billy, Billy Schellenberger. He is the superintendent of Clawson Public Schools in Clawson, Michigan. Um, if Tim could bring him in. Good evening. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We've got some light reading for you here. Very light. Thank you. Hey, so nice to meet you. Hello. Hello. Good to meet you. Hello. Pleasure. Nice to meet you. Hi, Billy. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you as well. Nice to meet you. You as well. Thank you. How's it going? Hi. Great. You? Pleasure. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are you set? I think so. All right, good. Uh, Ready to roll? We are, yeah. <laughs> good evening. Um, on behalf of Bloomfield Hole Schools, I would like to welcome you to the interview for the position of superintendent. I'll take a few minutes to briefly describe our format. Uh, we have allotted 90 minutes for the interview. There will be 20 questions from the board. Toward the end of the interview, time permitting, we will give you the opportunity to ask questions of the board and make a closing statement. We will let you know if time is becoming an issue and there is a need to pick up the pace of the responses. We have a clock up here that I will start after my little introduction. Okay. Um, and when there's 20 minutes left, we'll turn it around and show it to you just to let you know that there's 20 minutes left. Awesome. Uh, for those watching this interview in the audience, we welcome your feedback. Feedback can be provided by completing the paper forms available in the room and turning them into Mr. Tim Stein of the Michigan Leadership Institute. Feedback with the Board of Education can also be found by shared uh, also be shared by scanning the QR code or completing the electronic form, which can be found at bloomfield.org forward slash feedback. Um, although the task of choosing our next superintendent is responsibility of the Board of Education as the elected representatives of our community, we value and seriously consider the input of all of our stakeholders in the process. We will now begin the interview with two opening questions. So I will ask the first two opening questions okay. and then we'll rotate to each board member to ask three and then we'll reconvene for um, some of your feedback at the end. Great. All right. Sounds good. We'll go ahead and start. Mr. Schellenberger, the board has had the opportunity to review your application materials, but many audience members have not. Please briefly review your background and share what makes you interested in becoming the superintendent of Bloomfield Hills Schools. Okay. I'll start by saying uh, thank you. Uh, owe you a debt of gratitude for the opportunity. This is, uh, this is spectacular for me, and, and, and I'm excited to sit here tonight with you all, so thank you. Um, it's truly an honor. 
I'll start with the professional um, side of, of, of life. We'll, we'll, we'll say I'm proud to sit here as the, the Clawson Public School Superintendent. Um, have been in Clawson Public Schools for six years, four as middle school and high school principal, and two as superintendent. Honored to serve that community, um, serve a phenomenal board, and it, what, a, what a pleasure to, to go to work there every day, truly. So six years in, in Clawson. The, what drew me back to Clawson, I'll, I'll slide back a couple of positions and districts. I was a, a teacher, high school teacher at Birmingham Seaholm. That's where I cut my teeth in public ed. And was a freshman English teacher and a leadership teacher. So freshman for four hours and senior leaders for, for one. It was quite the contrast. While I was there, I was the boys varsity basketball coach at Clawson. So that's what drew me back and led me back to, to Clawson and the principalship there. Between that, Northville Public Schools, Northville High School as an assistant principal. What a pleasure to work for, an honor to work for uh, a man named Tony Koski. He's the principal there today, it's his 10th year, and last year he was the MASSP Principal of the Year. So um, to learn from that man and, and was, uh, was, was quite the honor. So I owe him a debt of gratitude for all uh, the leadership work that we did together and that he taught me. So Birmingham Seaholm, uh, Northville, and um, now Clawson, six, uh, finishing year six in Clawson, two as superintendent. Prior to, as you saw in my resume, prior to that, um, I have a unique path. For 10 years from college until, we'll call it early 30s, I was in uh, pharmaceutical and medical device sales, and um, I'm the son of a high school principal, single dad, who I went to school to be an a, a educator, and when I graduated, he said, don't do it. So I went to the sales route. And um, in retrospect, I wish I would have, uh, uh, listen to my gut on that one because uh, that would have been uh, pretty pretty awesome to start as a as a 23 year old teacher, um, but learned some great things in the private sector. That was um, and and still have great relationships from that time, but got the itch. Really wanted to um, scratch it related to impact and 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 laying your head down on the pillow and, and feeling like you did something today. So um, at 34 years old, I went and student taught at Utica Eisenhower High School and and uh, here I am. So. From a personal perspective, I live two miles uh, north and west of here, and um, I live with my wife, Kristen, uh, and son, Stone, who's nine, he's a third grader. We're in a pocket of Bloomfield Hills that's actually Birmingham School, so he goes to West Maple Elementary School, um, and what a gift uh, to have him in, uh, in that district in, at that school. So um, we spend a lot of time together. Um, it's important to be a present dad and, 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 and husband, and uh, that's one of the things that has drawn me here to today, um, one of the many. Um, but we, we spend a lot of time in the area and have embedded ourselves over the course of eight years in Bloomfield Hills, and um, you know, it's time to take that step. So I'll transition to, to the why. I know you said briefly, and I'm, 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 I'll close it here. Okay. So the why, um, you know, for eight years I have spent uh, a lot of time commuting to Clawson, amazing place, Commu commuting to Northville, amazing place and communities. And um, I've never led in, in the community where I lived. And I feel like it's time to embed myself in it and, and have a horse in the race, so to speak, um, and really be a part of um, leading where I live. And, and certainly um, one, of the, one of the best public school systems in the Midwest, if not the country here in the, in the, in the community that I reside and, and I voted you know, for uh, bonds and things. And, and I'm proud to, to uh, certainly be a yes vote for, for all of us. And, um, that's important to me, and, and, and the timing is right um, for that. On the, on the back side of that, being a presence with my family, again, love Clawson, but it's a, it's a little bit of a, of a commute, and to be able to, to be here locally would be, would be fantastic for, for that balance. So multitude of reasons, but those are two, two significant ones. Thank you. Yeah. Um, given your understanding of the Bloomfield Hills School District, what is the most critical short-term priority we need to address? And what is the most critical long-term priority we need to address? How would your background and skills help us address these short and long-term priorities? Short and long-term priorities. Well, I think there's gonna be a theme tonight, a few themes for, for me and my leadership style. And, and, and I'll start with uh, one that would be a short-term and long-term for me. Um, right out of the gate, it's culture. You know, I'm a, I'm a culture builder. Um, you know, it, it, that's district culture is important to me. And it's every day, you know, I, I, I equate it to the 100% the sales commission uh, salesperson. You have to wake up every day and sell something, right, to, to eat and feed your family and, you know, pay your rent. That's culture. Every single day as a leader, especially in the public ed um, space, 
you have to wake up every day and get after it pertaining to building a strong culture where people want to be. So certainly that would qualify, that would check the box for short term and long term, uh, in my opinion. I think that's, um, that's imperative. And I have a feeling over the course of this evening, um, I'll talk a lot about culture because that's uh, very, very important to me um, as a leader. You know, obviously it's, it's uh, in the climate that we're in with public ed related to enrollment um, and changes, and it's, it's so much different today than it was five and 10 years ago. Obviously, fiscal responsibility is imperative. Um, and, and I'll say this, it's, uh, I, that could also check the short-term and long-term box because I think that's a, a priority right out of the gate. Clearly, um, people are doing a great job. You, you, you should be commended for, for the work that's being done here, obviously, with your bond and with um, right-sizing and, and, and uh, obviously, at uh, you know, fund balance being near 20% is, is spectacular. So. Um, well done. So it's continuing that work, understanding it, but that never goes away. And in the climate of uh, decreasing enrollment, which over the course of the last five years, 24 of our 28 districts in Oakland County public districts have decreasing enrollment, and Bloomfield and Clawson are, are two of them. We have to pay attention to it. And uh, fiscal responsibility is a big part of that. So both short-term and long-term, and, and, and again, this, this my final one will we'll check the box for you on both, I think. And, and it's... This was in no particular order, certainly, but safety is um, is something that is is certainly a high high priority for for me as a leader. You know, in a smaller district, we wear a lot of hats, and one of those hats for me is is the safety guy, the safety director. Myself and our facilities and operations director, we we do it. I'm the Alice trainer, our active shooter trainer. I'm our um, guy in the OAC meetings every every week, talking about safety related to our bond work. And um, that will also never go away. And, and you know, I, when I put my dad hat on, you know, I want somebody leading my son's district, and he's fortunate to have a phenomenal superintendent, Nambika Roberson, doing it. But I want, I want that feeling that um, it's a priority for my son. So putting the dad hat on, knowing that I'm responsible for 1,200 young stone shell and bargers um, in Clawson, um, that's, that's the lens that, that I, I view it from. And, and that won't stop. So that is right out of the gate. Uh, it's, it's important and certainly that will never go away long term as well. Thank you. All right, um, the next set of questions will come from Trustee Van Gammert. Okay, <clears throat> uh, my three questions will relate to uh, district relations. Uh, first question, maintaining healthy relationships with the school and community stakeholders is important to the Board of Education. Please share with us how you have gone about building and maintaining successful relationships with all members of the school community. This is my wheelhouse. I've, I've got to be honest. This is, this is where I thrive. Um, and it's tough to say that because here I am sitting here talking about myself, which, you know, humility is, is, is important, you know, but um, I guess this is the hour that I'll do it, uh, you know, this one time, certainly, and, and it's important to, to, because I want you to understand um, how I lead. And, and I lead, uh, through human to human interaction every single day. So my goal as a superintendent of Clawson is to be in at least one building a day um, and sometimes up to all five. And it happens and, and I can proudly say that I accomplished that goal and that's how I build relationships. If I'm leading from my office, I feel like I'm failing. Um, and you know, with, with you know, strong Wi-Fi everywhere and laptops, we can, we can answer emails anywhere. So I'm going to where people are and um, you know, that's what I thrive on, um, and that works for us in Kloss, and I'm proud to say that relationships are, are rich um, for, for me, and, and I hope that, and think that those in Clawson would, would reciprocate that, but, you know, it, that's where it starts, presence and visibility, and, and again, that will, that will never go away. It can't, um, from my perspective, philosophically as a leader. So I'm gonna be in buildings, I'm gonna be at, in cafeterias. For example, today I was in a 35 minute student advisory council meeting with 15 middle schoolers and then two lunches. And um, you know, spending time with kids, spending time with custodians, spending time with our administrators and our lunch ladies. And um, that's how you do it. You, you, you don't do it from your office and you don't do it over email. So uh, you know, that, that philosophically is, is where it starts for me. Um, and, and you know, the transition from principal to superintendent can be a concern for some because you think that you may move away from that space where kids are and, and you know, being a, a student-centered 
um, leader um, who, who thrives on relationships. You have to carve it out the right way and be very intentional about that work as a superintendent and go to where those, those people are. So whether it's community members, whether it's um, events, whether it's cafeterias and hallways and you name it, um, I will be there. And that's how you build those relationships um, and maintain them. And I'm proud to say that you know kids from Birmingham and kids from Northville and, and kids from Clawson who are um, long since graduated, um, those relationships still stand and, and, and those are important to me. Thank you. What are some examples of community activities in which you have provided leadership and in what ways did, uh, did that benefit your district? Community activities. Two come to mind. Um, one a little, um, one's, you know, a, a pretty, pretty deep and, and pretty important. Yeah, they both are. Let's start with the first one. And, and every month I do what's called sit with the soup. Um, it's a coffee chat opportunity for, for me to connect with our community. And I rotate mornings for those who can have flexible schedule. And then, for example, the last, uh, last one I did was 5.30 in the evening at Three Cats in Clawson. Great restaurant, by the way. Um, shameless plug, but uh, phenomenal. They're incredible hosts to us. So it attracts. It's great. It's an opportunity to sit for 90 minutes-ish and have a very informal conversation and connect with our community. You know, and I think that that's impactful for, for our district, um, you know, because it shows continued transparency, which is important to our board and important to me, uh, and, and keeping a, a strong line of communication open in a, in a different capacity. You know, again, not through an email. This is me, and, and we're sitting having casual conversation over coffee, and, and it's been very fruitful for us as a district. That's one. The other one, um, you know, it's, it's sometimes tough to talk about, but just a little bit over a year ago, we were, we were impacted pretty greatly on February 13th by a traumatic event at Michigan State University, and one of our nearest and dearest uh, students um, was, was killed on that campus that evening, uh, and I'll never forget it. February 14th, we, you know, you get a phone call at 5 in the morning, and, and, and off you go, and, and um, it's something that uh, certainly impacted us greatly. It's a kid who was... Um, a three-sport athlete and, and um, scholar athlete into my Trojan Leadership Council at, for, in forensic science at Michigan State, and uh, she was the she was the the young lady that you want your son to meet someday. And um, mom's a teacher in our district, dad's on our board, and um, known them since uh, she was a kindergartner. So with that, here's this trauma, here's this crisis, and have to lead through it, and that's what we did. And I'm proud of the work we did. The part uh, related to the, the aspect of the community tie-in. Um, how it benefited us. It, com it benefited our district and our community because we healed together. We planned together, we worked through it together, we had events together out in the community, and it gave us an opportunity to support each other. And here's our community just wrapping their arms around us and, um, and that family, and to be able to be in that space with so many people. Uh, it's, it's odd to talk about this as a benefit, but you go through this together, um, very traumatic, and then you come out of it together in a space that um, grows you closer and helps you heal because we all needed to do that. So, um, you know, that's still ongoing, and, and, and we could talk about that uh, being an ongoing, um, you know, community events and activities, but, you know, that's one that will, will forever be, will for, we will forever be impacted by on a number of uh, fronts. Thank you. Um, effective and timely communication is vital to the success of a school district. Please describe the type of communication students, staff, parents, and the board should expect to receive from you. Communication. So important to be, to be extremely balanced. Um, nobody wants 10 emails a week from the superintendent in their inbox, right? But they want to be informed. Um, you know, that's, it's, so it's crucial. So the first thing that comes to mind is, is balance. The second thing that comes to mind with this question about communication, and we'll talk about both, is diverse levels of communication. So right now, how I communicate at Clawson is standard through email, um, of course. Big proponent of, of the personalized phone call around um, important events during the year, whether that's breaks, reminders, things of that nature. It's a personal touch that I think is important, and this goes back to culture building and relationships. The amount of equity we get from 
parents receiving the phone call heading into holiday break and then playing it, playing Mr. Sh playing Mr. Shell on the phone for their first grader, uh, is uh, the conversations have been um, have been rich around that and so fun. So you know things like that are important. That personal personal touch. And no disrespect to districts that um, that don't do that and have the automated calls, but we like to we like to mix it up and and, and really offer that. That's a, that's another important piece. I talked about. Uh, opening ourselves up to the community, the sit with the soup opportunity. And I open myself up every day um, at pick up and drop off. Um, for, uh, I'm at, this morning I was at Kenwood Elementary School during, during drop off and, and having conversations with parents on the sidewalk. That's important to me too. And, and those are some of the best conversations that, uh, that I've had. So one thing I added this year was a, a, a newsletter, quarterly newsletter I committed to um, from my office, from me. It's about celebrations and, you know, from each building. And, pictures and fun and, and um, committed to it and it's a it's a it's a heavy lift but it's it's a great one and and you know so that's another uh, diverse aspect of communication that parents receive now and would um, in in Bloomfield Hills so I go at them from from different angles and 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 you know keep them guessing on when they're going to hear from Mr. Shell but certainly um, keep it very balanced uh, you know balancing um, making sure our community is is communicated with and everyone is communicated with. And um, also, when we don't need to, um, it's okay to, to not. So um, we've struck that balance in Clawson, and I'm very proud uh, that, uh, to say that I think our communication is, is well done. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, no worries. So my questions are centered around political awareness. Superintendents are often faced with challenges of making decisions when there is no clear right answer and members of the community are split on the right path forward. Talk about a time when you're faced with a difficult decision where, you, where there would be a group of people unhappy with your decision either way you went. How did you go about making that decision and getting people on board with the direction you determined was best? That is a good long one right there. I appreciate these being up here. That's fantastic because <laughs> I would have um, likely asked you to repeat it, but uh, no need. So thank you. I can repeat it if you. No, I think I, I think I'm good. This is this is um, this seems to be a, an easy one for me. Let's talk about the bond, which you're, you're I think you're all familiar with. You know, we we've we've gone through two bonds. We're at 80 million dollars now in, in work, and um, when you talk about and then execute closing buildings. Um, hot button topic, right? Emotions run high, and, and I get it. Um, I would be disappointed to lose West Maple Elementary School and, and down the street from us. I understand we have two tradition-rich tradition, tradition rich elementary schools, neighborhood elementary schools. One has 150 kids in it, which is hard to believe, and another one has about 400. And we are gonna close one of them completely and converge both elementaries onto a centralized campus as we right size in a new building, a 100-year-old building that we're refurbishing. It's gonna be fantastic, but we're, we're demolishing one of those buildings and selling that building to a developer for a number of reasons. You lay out the bond in 2020 and 2021 and things of that nature with details and people kind of pass it by. But when the rubber meets the road and you start to get serious about the conversation and these things are actually happening, um, which they are right now with that particular elementary school, um, uh, uh, the board meetings you know, can, can get interesting related to, to comments and public forum. And, and we have been met with opposition on this one, um, a, a, a minority of, of, we'll say our community, but um, it was there. And it's now gone, and I can say why. Because we were so transparent as a board, and, and I have to give so much credit to, to our board in terms of execution, transparency of all of this, um, th this bond work, that the uh, quiet majority came out eventually and talked about this is what they said they were gonna do from day one. They've had public forums about it. Mr. Shell talks about it at his sit with the soup. Um, any level of transparency that you would need is there. And it, it slowed it down. And we're doing it for the right reasons. And that's what you have to talk about. Th those reasons are kids. If we don't do this, I'm concerned about our district thriving. I'm concerned about um, operational cost. I'm concerned about um, enrollment. You know, we're hoping to 40 homes go there and, and you know, 
if you get 1.5 children um, per household maybe, or two or three, that would be fantastic for our enrollment. So it's so we can remain fiscally or financially solvent. It's so we can thrive. And, and knowing how important our public schools are, period, to communities, Clawson epitomizes that. It's a two mile by two mile space. And if the public schools thrive, our community does and our city does, and these are decisions that were well thought out with every voice in the room you can imagine, municipal leaders, uh, uh, parents, students, administrators, and I led those, those committees, and um, we put those voices in the room to make those decisions, and now we're executing those. But it, 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 it's been a heavy lift related to a little bit of pushback on it, and understandably so. We sit and we listen and um, extend those conversations because it's important to people to be heard. And when it was all said and done, I think that's what it was. They just simply wanted to, to be heard, and we, and we did that. Um, and I think we'll call it agree to disagree. They at least respect our decision and why we made it, and I think that that's important. If you can please share a, a specific um, way um, that our district, or ways, our district could um, should work with other districts to support learning for all students. Okay. Was just in a meeting last week at CASA. So CASA is in Oak Park. Um, Oak Park is the fiduciary for CASA. It's a center for creative studies, so to speak, and mm -hmm. advanced classes. And seven districts converge on CASA. Ourselves, Lamphere, um, Ferndale, Pontiac, Oak Park, to name a few. And that's where our students go. About 20% of our juniors and seniors go there every day for AP classes, um, more uh, outside the box electives, like um, our kids love Detroit film study, our kids love there's a yoga class, they love that. Um, but that's where our, a lot of our driven students go to uh, for college preparatory reasons. So we collaborate extensively around uh, uh, the seven districts. We recently collaborated on hiring a new director. Um, we meet multiple times a year. These seven districts and superintendents and finance people around um, student offerings and opportunities. So why this resonates is last week we just talked about for the first time, we're excited about offering our students dual enrollment through Lawrence Tech. And it's the first opportunity um, from a four-year university perspective that I've been a part of. And computer science and cybersecurity are the options. And the hope is to um, certainly grow it. And you know our students who want to go that route of computer science or engineering, um, it's just one more layer of opportunity for them in a small district where sometimes opportunity can be finite. So what I would want to do is, and I said that in that meeting, we need to talk about other districts to grow this Lawrence Tech program to see if they're interested because there's plenty of young men and women in Bloomfield and Birmingham and Troy that want to be engineers and want to go the route of computer science. So, you know, I think it's opportunities like that with, with like districts where we can, you know, that's a big one for me, that, that four-year university dual enrollment option. We, in the county, we have OCC as an option. Every district does. Um, and it's a phenomenal option for our kids. But we've never advanced it to that four-year opportunity. And, and, and I think partnering with like districts here, um, I already mentioned a few, um, and, and having the relationships that I do with the likes of Mbika and, and, and Rich and Troy, and uh, we're, we're together a lot, and, and I've built those relationships over time that um, we trust each other, and I think that they would, they would be willing to sit down and collaborate around topics like that related to offerings um, at the four-year level, dual enrollment for our kids. Because let's face it, um, that cost is, is not going down, so any opportunity for us to um, um, offer uh, you know, additional resources to our kiddos before they leave um, our, our, uh, our campuses, I think would be fantastic, and collaborating with other districts is a way to do it. Thank you. you got it. Our reconvening um, our interview of Mr. Schellenbarger, and we just had yet another power interruption. So thank you for being flexible um, as we continue to go through this, and thank you for our staff who is working very hard to fix this for us. Uh, when the power went out, we did pause the timer. Before resuming the timer, I will um, re have uh, Trustee Southward repeat the last question so that those who are just now on the live stream can be up to speed on what it is that you're answering. Thank you. Great. Okay, so the question reads, what impact has the use of standardized testing results had on our education system in Michigan? It's a number of impacts. You know, I had, had started by talking about personal um, experience with standardized testing and being able to gauge where your your kids are at. It's nice. You know, that's that's been that's been helpful as a parent. 
um, as I've watched my son grow as a reader. But the other side of the coin that we have a lot of experience with, obviously, is, is you know, day-to-day -day standardized testing related to, and we just finished it. Um, there's, I would say, some, some concerns and some, some heavy lifts with it. You know, one of those is um, it, it's likely here and, and, and not going away, so we'll, we'll continue to get after it. But, you know, one concern is the gaps that it creates. You know, in districts where um, there are students who, you know, low socioeconomic um, and they're in, they're in that space, you know, who are college bound, for example, it's difficult for them to pay for tutors, pay for a Princeton Review course, or versus more affluent districts, um, that's what happens a lot. You know, no, no, um, no fault of a student, you know, spending thousands of dollars to be prepared for those tests. So you have two college bound students who um, ga a gap is created. Now, the other piece that's tough for a district like mine in Clawson is, you know, people um, move to, to districts that they think do well. Um, and certainly that makes sense. We did that. You know, that was important to us. But we are um, judged at times by um, tests like these where our kids are smart. They know if the test means something to them. An SAT, for example, if I'm going to be an electrician, the SAT um, is essentially meaningless. If I'm going to Michigan State, it's important. You know, so um, do kids take the test seriously when, it's, when it doesn't have as much meaning in a district where um, three out of 10, maybe four out of 10 students go to college? And then um, those, are, those are the aspects of the, uh, that you're judged on so, or, or graded or rated on. So it makes it difficult. So I think there are gaps that are created that are hard to, to fill. Um, and, and separations are, are created that are hard to, to plug, and, and, and that's a concern. Now, in our district, um, from a teacher perspective, teacher evaluation, for example, uh, was 40% data-based, 20% standardized testing, state, and 20% local testing. We just um, ratified our contract in December, and um, now it's 20% instead of 40. We no longer are basing uh, our teacher evaluations on a standardized test. That 20% is either iReady or an SLO, which is a stu student learning objective. So we have set that over here, um, and we're all, we are all in the we, in the room at the time. We're very happy with that decision. So again, it's here. Um, I've been working with it for 13 years, and 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 we'll continue to to do what we need to do and support our kids the way we need to support them because we put a lot of things in place to do that related to standardized testing. Um, but it can be concerning and create some gaps that, uh, that are hard to fill, as I mentioned. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Trustee Colvin. What is the most difficult decision you had to deal with in your educational career, and how was it resolved? Okay. So the, the role of, of a principal is Wow, was it a tough one? Um, you know the the dynamics that um, they have to work through daily is is intense. And, and I'll give you an example from when I was a principal. Being a student-centered guy, leader, relationship-driven, um, and some of the best relationships I have with kids stem from a, a situation where they made a mistake and they're in my office, right? And then we build a relationship from it. So that's that's the goal. Um, we had a situation a few years ago as a principal, um, incredibly difficult decision where we had a young uh, student, I'll just call it a student, and, and um, had a tip that they had a knife in their bag. We searched the bag and the knife was there. In the state of Michigan, there's a law. Uh, if the blade on a knife is over three inches, it's <coughs> automatic expulsion, we have no say. The MDE says they must leave your district for 180 plus days. So here's a, a, a seventh grade student who comes to us from Pontiac, um, student and, and mom live in a shelter, and um, her background as a 13-year-old was so intense, I said to her in a meeting, I said to the student, excuse me, in a meeting, um, do you know what an ACE score is? And I was shocked to hear a 13-year-old say I do. An ACE score is an adverse childhood experience, and that's an educational acronym about, it's a score based on your, you know, at-risk at students have, and for example, Mine's a one. My parents divorced when I was a young kid, and you get a one for that. Hers was a 10. The students is a 10. Again, I apologize for. So 
point being, at 13 years old, her path was a difficult one um, and led her to the point where here she is in my office with this knife, and I knew exactly what was going to happen. And when I asked the student why, the student said, it's because I just don't know when I will need it. And you understood that. I, I, she had no ill intent. The student had no ill intent, and, um, but our hands were tied. So we had to expel that student. Fast forward two years later, um, that student still at that um, space in Pontiac and applied for reinstatement, which is the first in my career after an expulsion. So the director of this institution uh, called me to talk through why this student um, was reformed and all that the student had done. So I said, I'm gonna come up and meet with you there in her, in the student's environment with mom. <coughs> Went there, listened, um, talked through um, change. Um, the student continued through VLAC, which is the virtual learning program, homeschool through Oakland schools, stayed on track, and was fully up to date academically. And we formed a committee through the board, which we have to do per policy, and, and um, made a recommendation to the board to give the student a chance and reinstate the student. And I'm incredibly proud to say that students in our high school now and thriving. Um, and that student said to me, the last thing that student said was, Mr. Shell, you will never hear a peep from me uh, for the duration of my career. And, um, and I believed her. I believed the student, excuse me, sorry. And um, you know, I, I'm, again, proud to say a year into it that the student is, is doing really well. So a, a, a decision that kept me up a few nights, because here's a at, highly at-risk student who has very little to nothing, and we're telling her she has to leave and when, when maybe the only happy place and two meals a day come from our building. Um, you know, but it, it, the good news is, is it's, um, it's resolved. Uh, uh, you know, the back part of this question is, how was it resolved? And it was resolved by us taking a chance, and I think um, that chance is going to uh, prove to be um, the right decision. But very, very difficult. Next question. What are the key elements needed to establish and maintain a good working relationship between you and the board? Well, I sit here speaking from experience um, because my relationship with my board um, is fantastic. I'm blessed to have the board that we have. Um, they are driving the same bus down the same road every day, and it's, and it's about kids. And we are, all eight of us are in lockstep. Um, so I know what this looks like, um, and, and I'm a part of, of, of why. I humbly say I'm a part of why, and that is obviously number one is, is a strong level of communication, which is, again, I'll go back to what I said earlier, it's balanced. When it needs to be urgent, it's urgent. And, and the last thing I want my board to be in the public and um, get blindsided by some information that they should have received from me. Um, so that's important. You know, things that aren't urgent, um, you know, we, we communicate regularly through email and then every single week I update, I do a weekly update, it's a rolling Google Doc, I think it's about 40 pages now, because every Sunday they get it from me, and it's just what my week looked like, and what was going on in our district. So that level of communication is imperative. The other piece is, I meet with my board president once a month, and periodically, individually with, for coffee, et cetera, for, or with the other board members, and um, some of them work in our community. For example, I have a board member who's a crossing guard, and every week I go to Kenwood, I walk there, because our, our uh, district is small and, and it's very walkable and stop and connect with her at the at her at her space and, and, and head into the building so opportunities like that to build relationships just like I will do with kids and staff it's no different with with the board I mean it, it's the time we'll spend together is is important um, and building the relationships the way I have um, through those again um, significant interactions and and listening to them and understanding their wants needs etc um, it's no different than um, what we'll do with what I'll do with community members and building relationships and what I'll do with our staff and, and certainly what I'll, I'll do with our students our board is uh, um, as important as as anyone and, and um, again I, I'm very proud to say that the work we've done together us eight in in Clawson has, has been great work and we get along um, you know swimmingly and, and it's uh, it's fantastic to to be a part of an entity that is moving in the same direction related to vision and, and mission like like ours is, and um, so that's that's a bulk of what I would do to to build those relationships with with you all. How would you inspire and engage the entire school community to in support of the district's vision and mission? So if you, that, that portfolio that I gave you um, on the cover page of the 90-day plan, 
I put your, your vision and mission, and what, what popped out to me in there, in both the vision and the mission, it talks about equity and inclusion. It's very important to me, very passionate about it, and we do a lot of that work in our district, and I'll, I'll touch on that here um, shortly, but that's the example I'm going to use. So let's, let's, let's use that example of, of um, that being important to our district, which it clearly is, your district, and, and important to me, and it's my job to drive that. <clears throat> Again, you don't drive that from, from your office, you drive that through modeling. And um, what does that mean? I'll go back to the example I used today. I sat in the room with 15 middle schoolers. We call that a student, student advisory council. I do that in all four of our buildings, have one in each building, about 15, and every month we meet. And the goal of that time is to listen to our students, and, and all of our students in the room are, come from different paths. And I learned long ago that there's value in everyone's path mine included. And kids in that room are from Clawson, kids in that room are from Pontiac, kids in that room are from Southfield, kids in that room are from Madison Heights. And today, you know what we talked about? We talked about cafeteria food. That's what we talked about for 35 minutes and I listened to their thoughts on it and how they felt about it. And then they give me feedback and I share that feedback as needed. So, you know, for me, that inclusive piece um, with, with kids like that is important and I'm gonna model that. That's gonna happen in, in BHS with, with me as the superintendent. I'm gonna be in their buildings with them. I'm gonna be in their cafeteria with them. I'm gonna be in the classrooms with them um, daily because that's important to me and that's how I lead. So I'm gonna inspire through, through modeling, um, uh, doing everything that I can related to, I, I, I'm not gonna ask somebody to do something that I'm not willing to do. So if I'm walking through the hallway of South Middle School and there's garbage on the floor, I'm gonna pick it up in hopes that people see that and do what the superintendent does because again, um, that's how you try to inspire and engage people through modeling being a servant leader. You know, and that's what serv servant leadership is and I learned long ago it's, it's doing those things and not necessarily needing anybody to see it um, but knowing that it makes an impact and not needing affirmations as a result of it and that's, that's modeling the great work that we have to do um, and hopefully that inspires, hopefully that inspires. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Mr. Schellenberger, my next three questions are around instruction and curriculum. Uh, what experiences and successes have you had with closing the achievement gap for economically disadvantaged and minority students? Hmm. We, you know, we, we have that today, and obviously in, in, in Claus, and we're at about 40, um, on paper percent free and reduced lunch. We have one title, title one school at 40% is probably 50, but it's 40 on paper. Um, so we live this every single day. So three things come to mind. I'll, I'll, I'll leave the success story for the end, but two, two interventions that we put in place to, to try to erase some gaps um, for, for our students who, who are at risk or disadvantaged and you know, one of those one of those pieces is, and I, and, and I stole this from a different district who's doing it so, so well, and I just thought it was a, a spectacular idea. I, right out of the gate as a superintendent last year in October, we had some grant funding that was, uh, you know, we were fortunate to have and we needed to use. And I implemented Academic Saturday School. So Academic Saturday School was, you know, one of my babies, uh, you know, to start my superintendency. And what that was is, is, is truly an opportunity for, the, for our students to, um, be in the same space on a Saturday with our teachers, um, specifically math and, and ELA, and with our honor students for two hours. And here's me opening up the door, bringing the donuts and, and welcoming our families, and at times we would get up to 50 kids, and it was you know, really, really successful and impactful. Do I know that it closed a gap? I'm not sure. I guess time you know, will we'll likely tell, because we're continuing it, and we have, we've enhanced it this year and continue to use some of that. We're fortunate to have those, those grant monies and we hired a director, one of our teachers is, is running it. So each, um, we have a special ed te two special ed teachers, elementary and, special, and high school who are um, directing it and it continues to be um, successful. And you know, that's an opportunity for our, a lot of our parents who, we have students who don't get picked up from school until five and six o'clock at times because parents have shift work and single parents, et cetera. So this is an opportunity when they're not working too. Um, to be a part of, uh, you know, be invested in our, in our school community and us, and we, we invest back. 
So um, very successful program that I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of. The second piece was we got really targeted with our summer school. Again, we've been blessed with, with um, grant funding since COVID um, and it's still there. The, the blessing is that it's there and, and the, the curse is that it, it goes away and you can't count on it, but we are using it, using it. And, and summer school was a big, big part of that. Very targeted with our students who needed um, needed some work related to uh, interventions, academic interventions, and, and, and closing that, that gap. So, you know, we, we've done that the last two summers. Uh, again, uh, for free because of that grant funding, which is, which is a big, um, big piece of it related to our disadvantaged students. And um, again, wildly, wildly successful. It's, uh, you know, it's essentially uh, the rooms are, are full. Um, our teachers love it. And um, it's been a great program for us. Last, last piece of this is the su success story. So in the fall, um, I'm in a room at Oakland Schools with 28 superintendents, 27, and myself, and um, Stephen Sneed, who's the director of data and assessment at Oakland Schools, was going over all of the test scores from Oakland County. And I already knew this, this good news. And uh, he put a slide up there with um, a, a plethora of uh, bar graph, some going north and some going south. And obviously you wanna be on the, on the side going, going north. And I knew that we're right where we were and I knew that we were the far right bar graph. And in Clawson, we don't usually land there. We, we um, uh, fly under the radar to a certain extent and we're, we're about on par with, with our county, but this time was different. And we had been told by Stephen that we were that, that um, uh, had the most growth, ELA growth, third graders from 2022 to 2023 in the county. And that was, it was such a proud day because there were superintendents in the room asking, how do they do that? Can you talk about what you've seen uh, related to what they're doing to, to, get, to get there? And he said, buy-in. He said from the, his exact quote was superintendent on down, buy-in, I see it, they're invested. And I could not have been more proud and I just sat back and really enjoyed that moment because our team, led by our curriculum directors and our incredible elementary teachers who are just game changers daily and I see it because I'm in there, um, deserve all that credit. So there's this success happening because we implemented curriculum directors for the first time in our school's history two years ago. Um, we were the curriculum directors as principals. So now with those positions filled, they're so invested in it um, and they're chipping away at um, our curriculum and, and, and our programs. And the, the first one was um, implementing CK, CKLA at the elementary level and the fruits of that um, were seen in that, in that room that day. And, what a proud day. So there are some successes uh, that, that we have had. There are still some that we're, we're waiting to see if they're working, but um, we're doing everything we can to, to bridge those gaps for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question, what's the biggest risk you've taken to do what's right for students? Uh, I'm gonna go back to our bond. Um, in 2021, we passed a, our, our residents passed a $55 million zero mill bond, and we started the project. We're three and a half years into a five-year project right now. Two years ago, um, it was brought to our attention in the summer that uh, we had an issue, and that issue was the dreaded um, inflation word. Um, things were up to the tune of 15%, labor, um, uh, materials, and we were now in need of our 55 million needed to be 62 million. So the conversation was, I'll never forget it, with our construction firm was either we need to shave scope off of this project or we need to raise more money. So we went back to PFM to find out what the options were and um, shockingly, the options were up to, up to 25 million more and at zero mills. So we, here, off I went formed our committee, um, again, municipal leaders, parents, teachers, students, um, and we started to talk about it. What do we want to do? Everything from nothing to 25 million and everything in between. Do we just want to do 7 million? What do we want to do here? We just came off a bond that passed at about 70%. Do we want to do this again? Long story short, unanimously at 96% probably of the group said not only let's do it again, but let's, let's go for for all of it, $25 million, because this is our only, sh only shot. This is probably a once in a career opportunity for all of us and our kids need it because we have a 100 year old um, building uh, from a middle school perspective and, and the stories around uh, our old facilities and operations, um, the list goes on and on and on. 
So we undertook that, um, that task. We started the campaign process. I spent the summer knocking on doors. I got caught in a rainstorm about a mile from my car with no umbrella, doing this, having conversations with people, just being in it and telling our story. And the story was kids and they deserve it. And because in Clawson we're small, we don't often get the brand new desks and the, um, the brand new LVT in every room and um, a brand new gym that's expanded. So um, this was our chance. This was our chance. And we worked through it with an active say no campaign um, happening while we were in it. And it passed at about 60%. And what a thrill. So not only did we bridge that gap of that $7 million, but here we are. We go back to the table with that team and talk about, OK, what do we do with this other $18 million? Now we can really do some fantastic things and touch every space in our district for the sake of our kids. So you want to talk about a risk? If that doesn't pass, we go back to the table and shave $7 million in scope to a project that we promised our residents we were going to do. Now that's talk about a tail between your legs moment that I didn't want to you know, under, have to undertake, but that was the risk we took, and it was 100% driven by, by our students and giving them um, this opportunity that they'll never see again, and I certainly won't in my career. So um, very proud of our residents twice in two years and 24 months, again, with an active no, say no campaign, and they really upheld it and, and did that work for us. And, and like I said, we have about a year and a half left in this project, and um, it's going fantastic. And uh, when it's all said and done, it's going to be an example of, of great facilities and some really strong decisions um, by our district that have been made and executed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last question for me is on special ed. Mm -hmm. um, would you believe are the biggest challenges with special education in our region? And how should these challenges be addressed? In October, I was asked by our now um, soon to be Oakland Schools um, Superintendent Ken Gottman, he was the deputy superintendent at the time, he asked me to write a white paper on IDEA or special ed funding and the concerns around it. That, he, that was backed, being backed by Congresswoman Haley Stevens and they were hoping to get it to the White House is what Ken said to me. And he wanted the small school perspective. So funding, I'll start with funding. Special ed is just very simply not funded appropriately. Um, that's the challenge, that's, that's challenge number one. So in order for us to, to fund it appropriately in our district, we have to draw from our general fund often and that takes away other opportunities for, for our district and students, no fault of special ed. So I wrote that paper, very proud to write it, um, you know, because we have a story. We have a story in our district. We're 1,200 students in our district. And um, you know, you can understand that there are challenges with being a small district. When you, when you lose 10 students, it's different losing 10 students financially in Clawson than it is in Birmingham. Um, no disrespect to Birmingham, not their fault. But my point is the, the, the impact is great and we continue to lose them as do many. So um, the lack of funding uh, doesn't help. Now how do, we, how do we address that? Right now we're addressing it through grants um, and, and that's that's the amazing news, but as I said, the, the detriment to a grant is that it, it, you can't count on it because it eventually goes away. But for the last three years, and, and what looks like a little bit more, um, specifically around ancillary staff and special ed, we've been able to fund um, staff and be fully staffed with social workers and school psychs, et cetera. And that funding is also paying for our therapy dogs, our four therapy dogs, which are expensive, as you can appreciate. So, um, you know, that, that aspect of what we're doing is working right now, at that long term, um, we need a better solution and we need help. But right now, from a funding perspective, we're utilizing some, some great grant opportunities to, to plug that, that, fill that gap. So the second concern that, that I have is around staffing. You know, the climate around staffing and teaching right now is, is different than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you left a district and you, you ultimately took a took pay cut because you didn't get credit for years, but now that's completely different. And special ed is truly the wild, wild west of, of, of teaching right now and, and good for them. Opportunity is, is robust. Um, uh, many of them who were not getting compensated um, to uh, where they should be are now which is fantastic and I'm extremely happy for them. So we have to stay competitive um, around staffing. 
I'm proud to say that in my six years, we've never started a school year without a, a, a filled special ed, with any gaps related to special ed positions, uh, which is fantastic. And I attribute that to our climate and culture that we work on extensively. That goes back to the theme of, of tonight a little bit. We work hard at that. And we've had teachers leave, go to other districts for different reasons, which we respect, and have come back because our grass is pretty green and we're proud to say that it is. And, and, and it's a great place to teach and it's a great place to learn. Um, we're now a little bit more competitive because, as I said, we ratified that contract. We were, we were uh, one of the first districts to do that in, in December, and um, we've become even more competitive related to that space. So we have to, you have to stay in the game related to staffing right now because it's a different, it's a, it's a different arena than it was five or ten years ago. So funding and, and staffing certainly will um, you know, remain concerns, um, certainly for uh, years to come, I believe. Mm -hmm. Over to a trustee fellow. <clears throat> Thanks for being here. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple questions on finances. Uh, the first one is, how would you ensure that our district spending is aligned with our priorities? Um, yeah, that's, that starts with team. That's collaboration. So. What we can't have, and we don't in Clawson because we, we can't afford to because everybody wears a, a lot of different hats related to um, the different jobs, finance, HR, et cetera, my position, um, ensuring that there's collaboration with those different entities, your, your business office and us and, your, you know, and, and, and goals and priorities. Those have to align. Um, so they have to marry one another. And, and the perfect example is, 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 is what I just talked about, our, our teacher contract. So it, without a shadow of a doubt, we needed to go to the table in the fall for that contract and being one of the first to bargain um, you know, some, some aspects of a contract that haven't been bargained in 12 years. You know, it was, it was, it was nerve wracking and, and, and financially we had to, we had to um, show up as a district, we did. And in a district where we fluctuate with our fund balance, 7% this year, 14 next year. And it, it, it go, it's all over the place because of our, 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 our enrollment. And we work hard at staying solvent. We work hard at our bud, with our budget. We work hard at being fiscally responsible. Myself and our assistant superintendent of um, uh, finance, uh, she's part-time. She's retired part-time but does the work of a, of a full-timer in two days. It's amazing. So I have my fingerprint on that as well because I have to in a, in a small district. So understanding from, from that perspective where we're at budget-wise and finan financially, versus what our priorities are and, and marrying the two together. So you're collaborating with one another and nobody's making those decisions or having those conversations in a, on an island. Uh, we're together in doing that. And the good news about how I lead is from a team perspective, that's quite honestly all I know and what I thrive on. So um, we're gonna do it together. We're gonna do it in a collaborative manner, in a collegial manner, and, and, and that's how we move in the same direction together um, by being communicative and transparent with one another. That's the only way to do it. Um, next question is, what opportunities do you believe budget limitations present? And in tough financial times, what are your top three priorities? They present a lot of limitations, um, you, you know, but the one thing that we have to do and, and we work hard at doing it is keeping everything on the table. Let's start with programming for our students. We can't eliminate anything. We have to work as hard as we can to, to make sure that everything um, remains there. And we're talking about performing arts, athletics. Our kids go to CASA, our kids go to OTEC, our kids go to IA, our kids dual enroll. Um, and we're able to maintain that through some, we have tough um, budget times. You know, it, it, it depends on the year, quite honestly. And last school year, we lost 70 students and we, were, we budgeted to lose 50. So, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is something that we are familiar with, but it's important that programming is maintained. You do that through, through making some tough decisions around, we're doing it right now, right-sizing our district. Operationally, we're gonna be in such a, 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 a great place from a building perspective and infrastructure. No disrespect to the infrastructure here. I'm kidding. Too soon about the power outage. <laughs> um, so, uh, kidding. So we're we're fortunate to have all of that work be, uh, done with the bond, and um, 
and that allows us to maintain things like our programming. The other piece too that, that is, is certainly, especially with what we have gone through as a district is safety. That can just never go away. And of this $80 million, so much of it is being spent on, on safety, whether it's secure vestibules or um, you know, our window coverings and you know, initiatives around. Um, we don't have SROs in our, in our district, so we have to ensure that we're being very responsible with this, these bond dollars around, around safety. But there can, fortunately, we have this bond to do that because our budget limitations might prevent us from um, doing some of those things. And that's a tough conversation to have. What if something happened and we said, well, we couldn't afford a secure vestibule, so we had a, an issue in our school with, with uh, an act of violence. That's not the answer that a parent needs nor wants to hear. And I'm not the person that wants to give it to them. So. Um, because that's my job to keep their child safe every single day, and that's a high priority. Uh, and that will, that will continue. We've been able to do that in tough um, financial times. Uh, I think, and this is the last three questions I've talk, touched on it, compensation. Um, again, in, in the, the public ed climate right now related to teaching and the, short, the massive shortage that we have, which is not going away, we have to remain competitive. You have to do two things. You have to build culture where people want to stay and people want to be. So you have to recruit and retain, and you do that through appreciating people and gratitude and kindness and balance. Um, those are important in building relationships and, and making sure that they know that they are appreciated. That's culture, and that keeps people and, and retains people, but people also have to pay the bills, and um, we respect that. So again, we had to get competitive um, this, this winter, and we did. So, Compensation is, is, is important um, regardless of your, um, you know, th those limitations. Uh, but preparing for that, preparing for that ahead of time, well in advance, is, is crucial. So those would be the three things that I think uh, um, would be priorities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, last question for me is, please describe your experiences with millage renewals, bond proposals, and sinking fund proposals. Well, I'll apologize for being redundant with, with yeah. the bond, but um, you know, it's a big part of the work that we are doing, and I know that you, you all have been doing it and are doing as well. Sinking fund, we don't have one. We know that we need one, and you know, that would be a plan, and we've talked about it, but we want to let our voters rest for a little while, right? That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a down the road um, decision. You know, I think maybe four or five years for, for Clawson, but we have to wait and see what this Oakland County enhancement millage brings. If it's on the ballot and it somehow passes, that would serve as a sinking fund um, um, uh, op option for us related to, to um, being able to push that down the road a little bit. So, um, so no experience there, but extensive with the bond. In 2021, I was a principal, and again, in a small district where you wear a lot of hats, and myself and the superintendent led the charge on a 50-person uh, bond committee that went for six months, and the decisions we were making about picking out a color of flooring in an elementary room, and this, it, it, it's in the color of a brick because it doesn't match the brick from 100 years ago, and you're, you're you know, it's, you know, very, very um, detailed decisions, and, but important for our community, it was fun, but it was a heavy lift, and so in 2021, that was, that, that got us that 55 million and then, and then back to 2023 where I mentioned that I led the charge on, on that campaign all summer. And um, that was uh, a lot of fun, great people, so a lot of the same people and people who are invested in our community, including myself, and we, we, uh, we got it done. So very proud of the bond work that we have done. One piece that is, I think is important to, to note is the level of hands-on that I am, not from a micromanagement perspective, but every single Wednesday we have an OAC meeting, which is owner architect and construction meeting. It's the meeting where we talk about everything. And about six months ago, our architect said to me, and I took this as a compliment, quite honestly, he said, I've never seen a superintendent in every OAC meeting. And I said, well, Brian, you've never been to a community like Clawson where it's this important. And, and, and like I said, we, everyone wears a lot of different hats. So that time is carved out for an hour and a half every week. And it's, it's vital that um, I am there, our, our facilities director and our assistant super finance are there to make decisions um, in real time and, and move it along. And I'm proud to say that three and a half years into this thing, it's on time and on budget, which is rare. 
but we have a phenomenal team and um, we're, we're blessed to have them. So very hands-on with our bond proposals um, as I would be here, again, in a, in a very balanced way where it's, it's non-threatening to, um, to those in the room, but it, it's, it's proved to be um, very beneficial so far for us. Mm -hmm. um, Secretary Noble. Thank you for being here today and for your answer so far. Thank you. <clears throat> How would you interact? I'm going to ask some questions about staff and personnel just okay. to give you the um, topic. How would you interact with our administrators in our district, and how would you strike a balance between giving them the support and autonomy they need to lead effectively while holding them accountable as appropriate and necessary? Okay. I may have to ask you to repeat that at some point because it's not up there. Oh, there it is. Okay. There, it is. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Got it. So scr uh, scratch that. Thank you. Um, it starts again with, with relationships. I'll go back to it, you know, that theme. Um, that's important to me, but this is where trust comes in. So I've sat in the seat for almost a decade, assistant principal, principal, middle school, high school, I get it. I understand their job, it's not easy. Um, uh, quite the contrary. And the moving parts and pieces that come with it are, are hard to believe at times. So it starts by me building relationships with them where they trust in what I'm doing and what I'm saying. And I'll go back to modeling. You know, um, it's, it's their building, but we have to take pride in those buildings. And, and I want to build relationships with them where, where they trust um, my guidance and, and in a way that I'm a resource, I'm a teammate. Um, they'll never, ever hear me say the word boss. It just doesn't, it's not in my vocabulary because that just doesn't work. We lead together. Um, I, I, I seek to understand first, which is crucial. When I was a principal, nothing worse than, um, for example, you get a parent email who's upset. And um, you never know what's true and what's not sometimes. And, and you know, you, wanna, you want people to seek to understand your side of it first as, a, as the building administrator to understand where things are. And I think that's important. So doing that will build trust. Um, but again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with them. I'm, this isn't going to be over email. This isn't going to be over Zoom. I'm going to be in their buildings. I'm going to be in their cafeteria with them and at their events with them and um, shoulder to shoulder with them, arm in arm, being a support being a resource so they get to the point where we know each other, we trust each other, and they believe in the bus that I'm driving and, and, and they want to be on it, you know, related to building a culture that keeps great staff and recruits great staff, keeps families um, and, 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 and brings more families in. Um, in a space like Bloomfield Hills where there are so many options where students can go, you know, that's imperative, building that culture with them um, arm in arm, so we we can do that. So we can keep the great people that are here and 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 bring bring more. So, um, but you have to balance it. I'll go back to that balance word again, so they don't feel micromanaged. It's their space. You have to respect it. Um, but a resource, a support, a teammate. Attacking it from that angle will build that trust. Um, and when you have to have those conversations around accountability, which can be tough, they don't have to be negative. They don't have to be um, difficult. They can be, uh, at that point in time, if you're doing it the right way, they are, they're, they're, they're guided in positive aspects of, let's do it together. I've, I've lived it with you, I understand. So this is what I have learned over the course of my career, and let's try it together. So um, there's ways to do that and balance it to ensure that um, they feel supported, relationships are being built, all the while they have autonomy and, and trust from, from me. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, um, could you please describe your most successful experience in building a high-performing work team? High-performing work team. This one, the first thing that comes to mind for me is, is about students, is actually. Um, so my first year as principal of Clawson High School, it was clear that I was looking for areas that we could grow. Um, gaps, so to speak, where there was need. And I found two in that first year that were important, our students with disabilities um, and our high-performing kind of team captain type of students. <laughs> so, I love it. So the, the, we started a Trojan Leadership Council. Trojan Leadership Council, TLC for short, is, is centered around our students, student leaders. I'll give you an example. 
I was a boys varsity basketball coach for years. I kind of cut from that cloth. My dad was a coach. And, and um, you made a team captain. Coach says, you're a captain. Be better. Be the leader. Uh, be a coach on the floor for us. Um, coach, your, lead, your, lead your teammates. Ready? Go. And off they go. Coaches don't have the time and the resources to add tools to their toolbox and how to be a better leader. They, we just have this expectation. And um, having that experience, I'm like, we need to give it to them. So Trojan leadership was it. So we brought 30 kids that first year into the, into the room and introduced them to what that was going to be about and the expectation. And it was about building culture in our building because people follow them. They're culture builders. What they do, other kids do. And fast forward to um, six years later, under the, under the umbrella of servant leadership, because that's all we talked about, and we centered it around this book called Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek the first summer that... Um, we were part there. We, we had them read that and talking about pushing others in front and leading from, from the back. And how we did that was we brought Unified Sports to um, our school that first year in 2018. If you're not familiar with Unified Sports, it's Special Olympics sponsors it, and it is semi-competitive sports for our kids. And we had a basketball team that first year, and we wa I watched our Trojan Leadership Council kids. We married them together, be the peer links in there. They led the student section in a in packed gyms. We were the first school in Oakland County to have a unified basketball team. Our gyms were sellouts. It was free, but essentially standing room only. And I watched parents and myself and our staff shed tears over students missing baskets, airballing shots, because this is the first time that they have ever had a, a tie-in to our building. And people are cheering for them and announcing them on the PA. And here's our Trojan Leadership Council kids, the best of the best on the floor with them, leading the student section, on the bench with them, guiding them into the game and making sure their jersey's on. And um, what a team. So the most successful, high-performing work team I've ever been a part of was that combination of those two. Um, and it bridged uh, a significant gap in our building and changed our culture. Now, COVID took our knees out from underneath us, but we're back. And Unified Sports is, is strong again. And, so was Trojan Leadership Council, and I feel like an old man because they had me come back last month and be their speaker, and our, our assistant principal introduced me as the founder of Trojan Leadership Council, and I felt so old. Um, but I was honored to do it because here it is, these kids in front of me um, doing what we wanted them to do and, and, and serving others, and wow, what a powerful team inside of a building um, just leading every day and building culture for you. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a great one. Um, how would staff members in your district describe you? <laughs> well, I, I would say in, your, in that, those documents I gave you, there's some, you know, it's hard to ask people to write letters of recommendation, right? It's, it's you know, it can be, it's, it's, that's a tough one because here you are asking them, tell me why you like me, right? It's, it's but you do it and, and wow, what an eye opener um, and how humbling and, 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 and those are the, the ones that are in your, some of them that are in your portfolio are from building level staff, one of our school psychologists and assistant principal who's also a parent. And the things that they say um, about how I lead are so important to me and, and, and I appreciate them. Thing, things like um, resilient and courageous, uh, you know, I, I lead from that, from that lens. I'm a, I'm a present man, I'm a visible man, and, and, and I can't not be, I can't do this job without that. I have to be with kids, with people, building relationships, that's, that's huge. Um, and I learned a work ethic from my dad. You know, he's a retired high school principal and the hardest working man I've ever seen, and you know, I take that from him, and, and, and I get after it with, with our staff, arm in arm, boots on the ground. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with them, I'm, I'm with them not far from them. I'm in their classrooms. I'm in their space together. And now it's to the point where I walk into a second grade classroom and it's very, very comfortable. Um, I walked uh, into a kindergarten classroom this morning and the sweetest young lady named Ezra, uh, good morning, Mr. Shell, six years old. And I didn't have that as a principal. Now as a superintendent, I'm able to broaden that leadership perspective and, and, and be in kindergarten classrooms and see the great work that's being done. So present, visible, um, Work ethic is, is, is a pillar of, of, of what I do, um, but a great listener too. I've, I've honed that skill. That was tough. When I was, my first year as an assistant principal, 
um, listening was not a, a strength. And I found that to be um, difficult to get through uh, some tough, um, to, to be equitable and, and inclusive with our students not being that great listener. And I'm, I'm really happy to say that I've learned over time that that's imperative and, and I've really honed that skill. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there, you know, because it's, it's, um, it, there's, there's some things that were said and I, I would invite you to read that that are, again, very, very humbling and I'm very proud of that work that we do together. Um, but I say that, I, I say that, um, and it means something together in our district. And that's why I think that culture is so strong because I'm nobody's boss and we're, we're all teammates and, and that is true. And that uplifts uh, and empowers what we do. And, and I think that uh, that's, those are some of the things that um, people would say, staff members would say about me. Thank you. Yeah, thank thanks. you. Appreciate it. Um, thank you for your responses to the questions we have prepared for this first round interview. We would like to take a few minutes now to provide you with an opportunity to ask any questions you might have for the board. Okay. Well, I took it, oh, go ahead. It's under 20. Yeah. It's 20 minutes. You've got the timer out for until you awesome. know how much time you have left. <laughs> Perfect, thank you, appreciate it. I took the uh, opportunity to um, spend some time, I, uh, Mr. Kumar and Ms. Hill, at, um, for fi uh, like a 15 minute informal session, which I appreciate, answered some questions that I may have had today, so that was fantastic. I appreciate you offering that. Two very, uh, you know, what I deem important questions, and, and, and it goes back to, to culture building and, and, and what, what we do as, as leaders in, uh, in, in the public ed space. I'm curious your thoughts on, very simple, points of pride that, that you have in this district. Why are you proud um, to serve it? You know, what's, what's happening in your, and I would assume as, as many of you are parents in, in the district that, um, that those different points of pride might be, might be different. So I'm curious about that. And then I'll, I'll ask the second one concurrently. It's, it's you know, what are some, some edges, some, some growth spots that you're looking for um, some change in, you know, you're looking for somebody to lead through. Um, so points of pride and maybe some, um, some edges to polish that a, a superintendent uh, can help with. Points of pride. Well, I personally have uh, very young children, uh, a three and a five year old. So I know the preschools very well in our district and I know it's not K through 12, but I am very proud of our preschool uh, teachers and I think it's really important to give them the credit where the credit's due because we have one of the top programs in my opinion in, in the, the, the county. Uh, but also uh, the opportunities what we provide, we provide such a diverse uh, range of opportunities for students to get involved with extracurriculars or co-curriculars. And um, if a student's interested in it, we can provide it. But we also have students that are uh, very uh, active and um, so uh, um, prepared to go on to amazing things that uh, we have some of the, the best uh, and brightest here in Bloomfield Hills, in my opinion. Sure. So. Thank you. Sure. But, oh wait, I wanted to say one other thing, though. What I'm looking for, what, uh, 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 some changes for under-resourced students, I'm looking for um, some, some um, focus on uh, helping those students uh, gain some momentum and some opportunity to get them to where they, they would like to achieve, okay. um, you know, to bring them to their level of achievement. Um, and that's some of the areas that I would like improvement in the future and long-term mm -hmm. um, progress, progression in. Um, I think it's the active and engaged parents uh, that we have in the community. Um, I have a student at each of each level, elementary and middle school and high school, and uh, throughout our time here, uh, whether it be um, in school activities or recreational activities, uh, there's volunteers everywhere. There's uh, I think it, it takes support from home in order to get those test scores that we talk about. I, I don't think those come, I mean, we have great teachers, but I think it takes that marriage of mm -hmm. the family and, and the school to, to really help students achieve. And I, I think that we have that here. Um, I'll take a minute to think about, you know, the second part of that question. And if, if anyone else wants to chime in. I just want to echo, um, I think we have some 
amazing uh, teachers in our district. To your point about recruiting talent, we have extreme talent within our within our organization. I would say we have strong PTO organizations as well. Um, very, very much so in tune and involved with what's needed at the school level, each individual school level. Um, I think our community is strong. Um, the support between our bond and our sinking fund um, shows that we have a very strong supportive community uh, voice that's here. Points of growth for me are always connected back to the classroom and education. And so I would say looking at ways in which we can um, better support our children who are at both ends. I would say those students who are high achieving, right, and so are in the classroom who need additional distractions beyond just the bird flying past, right? So what other things we can do for those students who are at the top level, uh, and then also our students who are falling um, a little bit below um, level, how can we also make sure we're addressing their needs? And then also looking at some of our uh, areas where students are either students of color, low socioeconomic status, our students who are on an um, IEP, making sure those students also are making progression each year. Um, we're no longer in COVID, so we can't use that as an excuse. So how do we continue to move that needle education-wise? Those are points of growth for me. And um, yeah, I think we have amazing administrators uh, in our district as well. Um, love, love, love Rebecca. So I want to throw a shout out for Rebecca right now too. So uh, can't do anything else without Rebecca. I think everybody needs to know Rebecca's name. So, yep. so, so my, my comments, two comments. Um, getting back to both your questions. First, in terms of point of pride is between our, all the staff in our district and all our community members. If you show them you care about them and their students, they will reciprocate. Mm -hmm. And I can come from personal experience on that. So that's a great thing about our community. To answer your second question, we need a leader who's gonna make a decision and stick by it but make a decision. So I think that's important for me. Well. Anyone else wanna comment on that? There's sure. 12 minutes left. Um, so we have, as, as Trustee Southward and, and uh, Trustee Noel mentioned, we have uh, you know, great teaching staff, very accomplished and engaged. We've got a very engaged community, high expectations, uh, we've got, as you can see, uh, a very strong mission and vision statement. We need to bring all of that together, mm -hmm. right? We need to corral those expectations and that energy out there between our community members, our staff, our administration, and the board to put together a strategic plan, which takes us to the next level of education in, in the state. Anyone else? Do you have any other questions of the board? No. Okay. That's it. Um, all right, we have time remaining. Um, I think it should be around 10 minutes or so. Is there anything else that you wanna add to conclude? Sure, if I could close, uh, I'm gonna mirror a little bit what I, what I opened with uh, around the why and, <clears throat> excuse me, as I've said multiple times tonight, I'm fortunate to lead where I lead in the community where, where I lead. It's, um, it's a fantastic place, a uh, great place for kids. Our families are supportive. It mirrors many of the things that you just said, points of pride. There's so much. Um, a great board, a great staff. Um, it's fun every day to go to work there. And it would take um, a lot to, to, to move me away from, from that place because I love it so much and I'm so invested. And this is that opportunity. And, and I didn't necessarily know that it, I, would, I would feel it in my, in my, in my gut that, that, that it was the right time, and, and it certainly is. And the opportunity to come here and, and get, in, get myself much more embedded in this community as a, as a resident, um, this community is very important to me. My neighborhood's very important to me. The relationships I have in your district with educators are very important to me. Um, and I would love to be a part of leading in the community that I have so much pride in. I've never done that before, and it's, and it's time. You know, certainly in a place that mirrors, you know, a, a couple of the districts I have been in related to performance, and, and um, you know, so my diverse background related to public ed lends very well to this, and, and, and in terms of timing and how much I have left, which is a long time in public ed. Um, and you know, I look forward to an opportunity to uh, balance my life, 
you know, with being more present uh, in my district because of proximity, and certainly with, with my family. That's important to me as well, to be a present dad and husband. So, um, but knowing the, the priority that being visible and present in a district is, um, this lends itself perfectly to that. So the opportunities in, in, in Bloomfield are, are robust, obviously, and, and, and resources, and, and I would love to be a part of that. But again, my background, which coming from three different districts and, and you know, essentially uh, the, the full spectrum of, of students and profiles and paths that I talked about earlier that, that we value, um, I, I feel really confident in, in this timing for, for me and, and my family and, and, and Bloomfield Hill Schools. So that's, uh, that's it. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, appreciate Mr. it. Mr. Schellenberger, we appreciate your interest in the superintendent position for Bloomfield Hill Schools. We will be interviewing a total of four candidates this week. Uh, we completed two last night and then two tonight. Um, the board will then convene a special meeting this Friday, April 19th at 5.30 p.m. to determine the next steps for the finalist interviews. Following that meeting, Mr. Stein will contact you to let you know where you stand in our search process. Thank you for your participation in this first round interview. Thank you all. Appreciate Thank you. It. And we will go into a 10 minute recess. Thank okay. you. Thanks everyone.